Okay, let's uh, get this show on the road. Welcome, everybody, to our uh, May monthly meeting. Good to see a lot of faces out there. Um, do we have any new members? I see a couple of faces I don't recognize or visitors. No. All right. Well, hello, members. <laughs> it's good to see you all. Um, tonight's agenda is going to be our club announcements. Then we'll go through a demonstration by Phil Sykes on chainsaw care and usage. Um, we'll take a short break with refreshments and fellowship and get right into the challenge table and finish up with the show and tell. Um, our challenge table has a few more. I figured there would be even more. I thought everybody here would be bringing in a piece that was signed, but I walked out of my house without one. So <laughs> best laid plans sometimes. Um, going to get right into our club announcements. I see a lot of you have already helped support the club by participating in our dollar sweepstakes. Um, our, this is our chance to win, uh, and it's not a craft supply $10 gift certificate to this time. It's a nice uh, face shield that that will go over your glasses. It's not intended to stop a log from hitting you in the face, but um, it will keep the... Uh, chips and everything from getting in your face and it will protect you from small items coming up towards your face. So, uh, it, it does, like I say, it fits over glasses. So it's a nice little shield. It does have a vent in it. So you don't fog up. Um, but if you haven't already, Mike's going around with a bowl. If you'd like to participate, a dollar will get you a ticket. $5 will get you six, right? Um, I want to thank all the members that helped with the open shop cleanup last Saturday. We didn't have a big group there, but man, we had some workers because in about an hour and a half, we got it looking pretty good. Um, if you don't believe me, go back and look at it and remember what it looked like last month. Um, we cleaned, we organized, and we did a little bit of maintenance on the lays and on the bandsaw. So everything's back there uh, doing pretty good right now. I would ask that we strive to keep it looking clean and organized. So please clean up after yourselves um, and clean up around your area when you get a chance. Um, this next, next Saturday is going to be the second of our second Saturday social. I plan on being there from nine to around 11 about was when people stopped by last time. I will br bring some donuts and look forward to talking about some turning. Um, I do appreciate the members that stopped by last month. I saw several faces that I hadn't seen for a while and, and enjoyed seeing them. Um, this will not impact the members. <laughs> this will not impact the members who want to turn on that Saturday. So don't let it stop you. Come on in and turn your projects. Um, I can tell you from last time, Fluffy Fresh beat out uh, Krispy Kreme 100%. So I don't know if I'm going to get by a Fluffy Fresh, but I'll at least bring the Krispy Kreme and hope that we get another box of Fluffy Fresh show up too. Um, our club added a couple of new members over the past month. So we got a couple of new ones that makes us right around the 150 mark for total club membership. Um, and then Mike Erickson, is it Mike here? I don't see him. He's real close to uh, completing a plaque that recognizes the members who have passed away for that, that were club members. Um, these members are the inspiration for a new KCWT Memorial Scholarship. Uh, this scholarship will cover the cost of a hands-on class that we're offering this year. Um, and there is an application available on the KCWT website. So if you are a new member, are interested in a hands-on class and want to see if you can get one for nothing but an application, uh, look at the website, fill out an application. There's also a drop down if anybody's interested in um, donating to the, uh, the Memorial Scholarship Fund. So you can look at that, look for that on the website. Um, please 
let the board know if you have an idea that could improve the club. We had a few come in kind of from members that uh, were taken up and we're implementing some things there. So if you've got an idea, uh, the board would appreciate hearing about it. And then lastly, as far as these announcements, uh, some of you may have heard that the shop is going to be moving. We've got a, by May of 2024, we will be out of this space. Our landlord is kicking us out at the end of the current lease to allow expansion of the company that's next door. Um, it may be sooner than May, but uh, we are going to be moving. So um, if you've heard rumors, the rumors are true. Our plan is to re remain a tenant with the Wood Woodturners Guild. So we're hoping to keep that um, relationship intact. Um, and the guild is actively looking for alternate locations in the city. They've got a, a group of members that that are have a checklist that they're going through. And we also have a representative, Mike Thomas, is sticking with that group so that he can kind of see what's going on and, and be on top of the latest uh, developments. Um, I, I said rent will likely go up with the move, actually. Mike said, take out likely rent will go up um, and could be considerable, but we'll have to just see where we end up on that as we don't have a final resting place yet. Um, we'll bring you information as we get it, but that's about all we've got right now. We're actively searching for a space and we have um, the guild looking at us as being a tenant again. So we won't, we won't be breaking that uh, relationship down at all. I am sure that we will be able to use any help when it comes to that time. So keep in mind that we're going to have a time where we're going to need some, some uh, bodies in order to get that to accomplished. But uh, we'll worry about that later when we know a little bit more about what's going on. Um, locating information for the club, uh, the best way is the website, KCWT, KC Woodturners. Dot org. Um, and you can also, we don't have a wood chips going out right now because we're short a secretary, but the wood chips is another way to get information. And you can always ask one of the board members, can I get the board members to raise their hands? Any of us, we can get an answer for you if you've got questions. Um, help wanted. Our club needs a little bit of help. Um, the board is still seeking a member to become a cl our club secretary. If you're interested or want to know what that would entail, please talk to me or one of the other board members and we'll try to line you up. Um, a lot of it is in, in entails uh, keeping the minutes and the agendas for the meetings, as well as creating the Woodship's uh, newsletter. Our, and uh, I'll tell you right now, the board will be more than happy to help that member get accustomed to that position so um, we still need it we should have one but uh, right now we're without let's see we are in need of a few additional shop openers I've said this for about six months I haven't had any new people come up but if you do use the open shop please consider being an opener and there's uh, Wednesday nights and Thursday nights are both available Anthony and I have been kind of playing tag and, and covering those nights. Anthony's covering most of the nights, uh, but I'll pop in there on, oh, I think it's the first Wednesday I, I committed to. Um, we're also, uh, the club's also looking for demonstrators. So if you have a project that you think might make a, dem, uh, make a good demo, talk to Mike Thomas, and he'd be happy to kind of line you up with the date or uh, help you see how that could could be become a demonstration and we're always looking for members to assist uh rob with our av and we had a volunteer tonight to run the camera we appreciate that um he doesn't have any major needs but he could probably use somebody to back him up every now and then so if somebody wanted to kind of learn a little bit about what it takes to run the cameras and and get the meeting through um talk to rob i'm sure he can fill you in on that uh, okay we're down to upcoming uh, activities and events um 
this or uh, this month on May 24th from six to nine, much like we did in April with the shot glasses that we were making out of the baseball back cutoffs, we're going to be doing baseball display stands out of the baseball cutoffs. And again, these are items that we're going to donate right back to jaw bats um, so that they can give them away at their tent during the, I think it's the college world series that they have a tent. And I think there may be a couple other events. So they just wanted some give me away, give away things that uh, for that. And because they're basically willing to fill us up with as many baseball back cutoffs as we can keep up with, um, we wanted to give them back to them as a thank you for that. Um, also coming up, Anthony will be teaching a beginner spindle turning class. I think we're looking at uh, late summer or early fall for that. We haven't put a date to it, but keep your eyes out for an email regarding that. And uh, something that's right around the corner is the club picnic at Shawnee Mission Park. It's scheduled for June 17th. Uh, the members will bring the sides and and usually your whatever you want to drink, you better bring that. Um, no alcohol. Um, and then the club will provide hamburgers, hot dogs, and the condiments uh, necessary for that. We usually start around 10 a.m., and we get hungry fast once we get there and start talking. So we're usually cooking by 11. And if you wait till noon, you may get the last of what's there. But uh, plan on showing up early enough that, that we could start cooking at 11 and, and get to eat and probably by 1130 or so. Um, upcoming demonstrations in June. Mike Erickson's going to show us how to turn angels on the, on the lathe. Um, and in July, we're, we've, the board decided we're going to do, um, something in regards to quick and simple turning ideas, of uh, things that could be sold at the Irish fest. And we'll make that our challenge, um, and assume that the challenge pieces will be, uh, given back to the club for sale at the, the Irish fest. Um, so that challenge would be august so that then we'd have them available for september the irish fest is uh the labor day weekend so first weekend in september um all right that that gets me through the announcements and i think we got a fun demonstration tonight phil sykes is going to he's going to combine his uh, monthly safety minute with a chainsaw a presentation of chainsaw care and usage so uh, with no further ado, you all know him. Welcome, Phil Sykes. There we go. Now, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? I swear I'm not turning it off. Hey, there we go. All right. I, I'm not turning this thing off, so it's not me, Rob, but it keeps turning off. So I blame Kevin, too. Thank you, Kevin. They blamed me earlier for something, and I think that's that's just karma. Kevin is what that is, maybe. All right. Um, There we go. <clears throat> this is the professional way to do a demonstration. You have this uh, situation where your mics don't work, and then and then everybody gets woken up. Um, good evening. Thanks for coming, and uh, hopefully you guys learned something here tonight. We're going to start with a uh, a safety minute because I'm going to talk about chainsaws, and as many of you probably think, chainsaws are dangerous, and they are dangerous when used improperly. Uh, when used properly, they're they're safe to use, um, but you still have to be very careful while using them. And you should always take care and you wear proper protection. So some of that protection involves these. Yeah. 
These, these are uh, chainsaw chaps. Does anyone know or own a pair of chainsaw chaps? A few people. Does anybody know what happens when a chainsaw cuts into one of these pairs of chaps? It does not cut into your leg. That's correct. Yes, it balls up. There's a whole bunch of nylon fibers inside here, and it will actually stop the chain from spinning on your chainsaw and not cut your leg. So that is very important. These are, I think when I bought them, they were like 45 or $50. They are worth it because it will save you from a trip to the emergency room. So chaps, one thing. Um, now, I could not find my helmet, so I brought my face shield, which is what I usually wear when I'm cutting up wood, um, bowl blanks and things. But you can also get a uh, wood cutting helmet, which is essentially a face shield with a hard hat on top and ear protection. Um, you want ear protection, depend if you're using a gas saw like this one right here. I always have some kind of an ear plug in whenever I fire this up because it is really loud. And uh, I've, I'm hard of hearing enough as it is. So um, I need as much help as I can get. The other thing you want to wear are going to be a pair of gloves. The, these are gloves similar to the chaps that actually have a uh, uh, nylon pad in here that if it hits your, your uh, hand will hopefully not cut into your hand. Um, but otherwise, they are just kind of standard leather gloves. Um, you could also use something like like these, and these are cut resistant gloves. These these are cut level one, which is not very cut re resistant, but it will help if you are handling your chainsaw chain and you actually only get caught because you've just sharpened it because you learned how to sharpen it. And uh, so th these are handy too. These are great because they're more flexible and you can kind of feel the saw a little bit more, um, but they don't offer the same protection as the, the actual chainsaw gloves do themselves. Um, the other thing for safety, and you may not think about this, is a wedge. Do you guys know what a wedge is used for? Anyone, anyone, you, sir. Keeps it from binding. You put this in between the, the, the kerf of your log as you're cutting. There we go. And that prevents the log from pinching the blade and, uh, and causing it to bind up. Also very important, you should carry a couple of these. And sometimes it's helpful to carry something to bang it in with so you can tap it in, or if you need to get your blades out because you got it stuck, you can also use a wedge and a banger of some kind to get it out. This also has a hatchet on the other end, which is great for removing small limbs and other sort of things. You don't think of this as a safety tool, but in chainsaw world, it actually is a safety tool. And the last thing is this guy right here, which is just another saw, but this is a hand saw. It is not as powerful as a chainsaw but it's great for taking off small limbs very quickly, especially out of a fresh uh, tree uh, or one that's been down on a while. Uh, the, uh, the teeth here are really great at cutting through green wood. I'll even take this and use this to cut up, you know, little branches and things like that because it is safer than using a saw. Now, the, the reason why you want to use safety protection when you're working with the chainsaw is because you don't want to end up in the hospital. And I have a story about ending up in the hospital because of a chainsaw. So I um, I used to go out to California when I was a kid with my family, and we'd go to my grandparents, and they lived up in the Sierra Nevada mountains, about two hours away from San Jose, two and a half hours. And uh, my grandfather, every year, would cut enough wood to heat their home. And so every summer, me and my brothers would go up, and we'd be all excited to split wood, which I think was his way of uh, um, getting us to come up there and help him take care of his wood problem. Um, but he would buck up trees and uh, roll them over. And there was this big, I think it was like a hydraulic splitter with these arms on it. And we would pump this thing all day long, you know, cause we were young kids. We didn't know any better. We thought this was fun. And uh, we would split the logs up and, and, um, and then he'd have wood for the entire winter. Well, my dad was helping him buck up a tree once. And my dad decided that it would be smart to help hold this log so that it didn't roll on my grandfather when he was done cutting through it. So there's a few things there, but we'll just skip over that for now. But the chainsaw did bind, uh, and instead of leaving the saw there in and trying to get it removed, my grandfather yanked the saw out right into my dad's leg that was right over here. And he caught him right across the knee, right over here. And uh, so as I said, they were in the Sierra Nevada mountains, two hours out of San Jose, and now he's got his leg split open uh, from a chainsaw. 
So they stopped the bleeding as best as they could. They got him into a car, and three and a half hours later, they got to the ER. And uh, my dad got a knee replacement later on after that happened. So um, if he had been wearing chaps, that probably would not have been quite as bad. Probably would have still gotten hurt, but hopefully he would not have gotten his knee cut through like that. So I encourage you to save all of your medical bills and uh, tally them up and see if it's cheaper than a pair of chaps and a helmet and see which one is better. Um, Cause even just the three stitches I got on this finger, because I had a really nice sharp uh, tool that I was using incorrectly. I was trying to hold something where I shouldn't have, and it sliced through my finger. That was $3,500. And so, um, you know, just a simple trip to the AR for a couple stitches and get expensive. Anyway, that's your safety minute. Um, the other thing that I would like to say about safety, though, is that I am not a trained, certified arborist in any way, shape, or form, or trainer on how to use a chainsaw. So I encourage you, if you're going to use a chainsaw regularly, to go ahead and take a course, whether it's through uh, the Kansas Department of um, Outdoors and this and that and the other thing, um, or, or a community college or somewhere in Missouri, uh, or through a store, whatever it might be. I encourage you to do that if you are going to be using a chainsaw for any length of time. Um, how are we doing on that mic? We're getting there? Okay. All right. Uh, any questions so far about safety with a chainsaw? Okay, good. All right. Um, okay. So we can actually talk about why why we'd want to use a chainsaw um, because we're wood turners, right? You're not going to use a chainsaw on your lathe. I don't think. Has anyone tried that before? Check, check. So we did have a demonstration on that? Who was that? Oh, well, he's Irish. They're they're crazy. I'd let Liam do it. I, I I've seen him demo before. He's a he's a pretty funny guy. But uh, generally, you would not use a chainsaw on a lathe, but you might want to use it to cut up blanks, turning blanks for bowls, for vessels, for uh, spindle turning stock, um, because wood does actually grow on trees, and it is all around us. And in our urban environment, they tend to be falling down all the time. Um, Rob, when you get a second, we'll go with uh, slide number one. Ta-da! This is the perfect one. So we might want to use a chainsaw to cut up a log that has freshly fallen on our neighbor's yard because it is a whatever species that we've never turned before and turn it into bowls or other sort of turning stock. When you're cutting up a log, you want to remove the pith. You probably have heard that one before, but that middle section of the tree is going to crack if it's not already cracked. So the sooner you can get it removed, the better. Um, on this log, they show you've got a larger section on top, that's great for a nice large salad bowl. Large section on the bottom, also great for a nice salad bowl. Your middle sections there are some nice quarter sawn material that can be used for a lot of things. I like to use them for small bowls because quarter sawn material works really well for that. Platters are a great thing to use quarter sawn material for. Um, but, but the idea is that you'd use a chainsaw to do your, your rough um, cutting of that log to get it into a bandsaw, then refine the shape on the bandsaw, and then finally put it on the lathe. Um, so I guess the reason why you'd want to use a chainsaw is because there's plenty of wood out there that you don't have to pay for if you ask really nicely. Um, and especially if it's a neighbor or somewhere close to you, hopefully it's not too difficult to cut it up there or get it over to your home and get it cut up there as well. Who has actually cut up uh, with a chainsaw or, or a bandsaw uh, a tree or piece of wood that they have found on the ground, in a neighbor's yard, in your own yard, to use for turning. So a lot of you have. Some of you haven't, and that's okay. Because um, it's a whole other process than just going to the store and buying a blank or buying a plank and dividing it up into turning stock and then getting getting going on it. Um, there's a whole drying process, which we're not going to talk about tonight, because um, we're talking about chainsaws. Um, but uh, there's a lot of opportunity for doing unique things with green wood that's just been just been felled on the ground, and you can cut it up and get it in any shape and size you want. It's hard to get a bowl blank that is six inches deep and 14 inches round for you to start with. You can't really go to a uh, Rockler or a uh, Woodcraft and buy a blank that size. Um, they don't exist. 
um, because it's really hard to dry that material and they want to sell, you know, dried material. Uh, so being able to cut up your own material is a great way to get started on getting some larger pieces if you're interested in that kind of thing. Um, Rob, let's get rid of the slides for now. We're good on those for the moment. So um, that kind of covers why you might want to use a chainsaw. And if, if you're unsure of why you'd really want to use a chainsaw, we can talk about it later. If you have any questions, let me know. But I want to get into care and maintenance of a chainsaw. Um, now, I've been using a chainsaw regularly for about seven years, seven or eight years or so. And prior to that, I'd used one kind of infrequently here and there. Um, but it, once I started turning, I started using one a lot more. Some of you have probably used a chainsaw for a lot longer than I have. You probably have more experience or might have more knowledge. And if you have something you want to throw in tonight, let me know, because I think there's a lot of stuff that I don't know that I can learn from some people who have been using saws a little bit longer than me. Um, but I do like to take things apart, um, like when I was a kid, Legos, toasters, all sorts of things like that. And so I love to take my saws apart. Um, I actually bought this big saw here um, that, I'll that I'll show you later. Um, for the specific reason of if I took it apart and I broke it, I wouldn't be that sad because I didn't pay too much money for it. I did pay a, a decent amount of money, but it's not as expensive as buying one brand new. This little saw right here, we're going to start with that. Now, we'll get to why you might want a big gas chainsaw in a little bit, but this is an electric saw, um, so there's no gasoline, which is terrific. It's not very noisy. There's a little bit of noise to it, but it doesn't smoke. It doesn't make a lot of noise. Uh, and I can actually use it in my workshop. And the reason why I use it in my workshop is to, when I do have a big piece of wood that um, I need to cut off maybe the corners to get it round enough so I can get it on the lathe, I don't always want to use my bandsaw. Uh, and so this has a nice, reasonable size blade that I can kind of prep a piece of material to get it onto uh, the lathe. Or if I've got just something that I cut too big when I was outside with the bigger saw, I can use this to more easily cut it than I can through the bandsaw. Unless you have a giant bandsaw. Who's got a 36-inch bandsaw? Anyone? 24? All right. I'm going to visit you more, Mike. You're down south? Okay, great. Um, but, uh, but if you don't have a 24-inch bandsaw or something huge like that, a small electric chainsaw like this comes in real handy to be able to process material in a shop in the middle of winter, in the middle of summer, on a day like today where you don't want to go outside with a chainsaw and get all garbed up, you can do it in a nice air-conditioned workshop or basement or garage or whatever you might have you. Um, I actually just got this about a year ago, and I wish I would gotten it a lot sooner because it comes in very handy. It can also cut up small logs pretty easily and cut up branches, all sorts of stuff. Um, this one is a, you do need a cord for it. It is, it is a, a wired um, saw, and I do recommend a heavy-duty a minimum 12 gauge cord um, when you're going to run this saw. Generally, the shorter, the better. You don't want them to be too long as well, because this will take the full amp um, uh, or wattage pull that it can. And uh, if if you don't have a, a big enough cord, it'll heat that cord up real hot because um, it's going to pull a lot of power through it. This model is really nice. It does have a, a, a circuit in there that if it's going to pull too much power, it'll shut it off. So. If you're getting too big of a cut in there, it'll go ahead and turn itself off um, and not allow you to burn out the motor. Because with an electric motor, the, the worry is, is that you actually can burn out the motor if you're stressing it too much. And uh, so this has a trip mechanism for that. Some other older electric saws don't have that. And so if you go buy like a used one at a garage sale for 25 bucks and you plug it in and it doesn't sound real good and uh, seems like the light's dim, yep, then uh, it could be there's something going on with that. Um, and I've used one like that, and uh, it did cut a little bit, but it was not a fun experience and not a safe experience either. Uh, so an electric chainsaw is, is really nice because there's very few components to actually clean uh, and maintain while you're using it as well. There are plenty of battery-powered chainsaws out there on the market now, which I've not really used before. Uh, I know there's some, some good ones out there, so if you're interested in a battery one, my thing with batteries is if you don't use a battery, it tends to wear out a lot more rapidly. So if you're going to use it regularly, that makes sense, especially if you want to use it around your yard or your property. But if your primary idea is to use it in the workshop, a wired electric chainsaw is a great tool. Um, it doesn't have gasoline, which is great, but it does have oil right here. And that oil is for your bar uh, and chain. I guess I should call it bar and chain lube and not bar and chain oil because it is more of a lubricant rather than a... Uh, an oil, you don't want to dump your used car oil in there. I know a lot of people do that kind of thing. It's really not good. 
um, because it will shorten the life of your saw and your bar and your chain there as well. Um, But essentially, all you need to do to clean this guy, it has a cool little, there's there's no uh, big uh, bolts or anything on it, but I got this, uh, go to the front camera. There we go. And Rick, if you want to zoom in down here. There we go. It's got this cool little uh, thing on it right here where I can loosen. There we go. My bar right here, and this will allow me to actually adjust the tension on my chain. All right, tighten it up. There we go. Loosen it up right there. Now, I wouldn't want to start my saw like that because that would not be good. So I keep spinning this guy off right here. There we go. I get to the inside of my saw. I can carefully, I don't want to cut myself on my chain here, pull my bar off get my chain off. There we go. Uh, now, some people will like to use compressed air and spray all inside. On some saws, I'm sure that's perfectly fine. On other saws, it may not be a great idea. I try just to use a toothbrush. Um, it gets a little bit grummy, so if you're planning to use that later in the evening, I would recommend not using that toothbrush. Maybe an old one. Definitely don't borrow your spouse's and then replace it because that would not be good. Um, but I like to use a toothbrush. Just going to get in here and get around, kind of clean it out. <clears throat> Brought my garbage can because it's actually helpful just to do it straight over a garbage can. And all this is going to be is this going to be the uh, remnants of whatever got stuck in between your cover there and the uh, the body. A skewer works really well. I guess I can move this out here to get inside the little areas in here and get the big chunky things out. And really, you don't need to go like deep clean it every single time you use it, but you generally just want to get the biggest pieces out of the way. And make sure that your clutch spins freely. There we go. What's that, Mike? Yeah, your air hose is your friend. And on this one, an air hose is perfect because it's pretty much all enclosed that I can get in here and spray out just fine, and it's not going to cause that much of an issue. The one main thing you want to look at when you're cleaning out inside here is that your bar and chain lubrication um, comes out of this little hole right here. You want to make sure that this hole is clean and you have nothing inside there. A small needle is going to be great for just kind of getting in there if there is something in there, you should be seeing some kind of lubrication coming out of it. And um, and that's a good thing. If there's a small puddle of oil underneath your chainsaw when you pick it up, that's actually a good thing. If there's a big puddle, that's a different problem. We'll get to that. But a small puddle is okay because that means that you are uh, not blocking up this little hole right here, which leads to your lubrication over here. Um now, for just general maintenance, that's all I'm really going to do on the inside of the saw. If it was the end of the season and I was going to be putting this away for a while, I would probably come in with a degreaser. Um, question, WD-40, degreaser or lubricant? Junk? Water displacer? Okay, yeah. WD-40 is a degreaser, which is not a lubricant. A lot of people think it is a lubricant, but and it is pretty slippery but it will actually not lubricate your things. Um, this is also just a degreaser cleaner, um, simple green. I like it because it is not as smelly as WD-40, um, but I would use this to spray on a cloth like this, not directly on my tool. And then I would uh, just get in here and start cleaning everything out and get it nice and clean so that when I want to you know, use it in a few months. It's already clean and ready to go. And uh, the other thing you can do, which I'm not going to do here tonight, is you can take off this, this is called the clutch cover right here underneath here is the actual clutch assembly. If you take that off, you can get a little bit more access in there. There's also a um, needle bearing that you need to lubricate every once in a while. And usually that's that's about a once, once a, a season type of thing um, if you want to get in there and do a little lubricant. Or if you take it to a shop that's going to do a tune-up, Usually they're going to pull all that apart, make sure that it looks okay, lubricate your, your bearing cage right there, and then put all this back together. So general maintenance, you don't have to bother touching this at all. 
seasonal maintenance if you want to, or if you're going to take it to a shop, they would kind of clean out underneath here a little bit more. If your saw gets super dirty, um, it is a good idea to kind of clean off um, after every usage right there. And I recommend cleaning out after you use it, not uh, before you're about to use it, um, because you don't want stuff sitting in here forever and just kind of starting to rust up any of the metals or deteriorate any, any of the plastics that might be in here. Um, there we go. But so far, that's not too hard to do, right? Take off your bar and chain, clean out underneath there. I guess I should clean the, uh, this is the cover. The cover always gets maybe a little bit more dirty. Same thing. Now on your clutch cover, it's going to press up against your bar right here. So you want to make sure that those contact points are nice and clean and that you don't have anything in between those points when you put your bar back on. Um, so let's take a look at this real quick. This is the bar. All I'm going to do is just wipe it down with a paper towel that has a little bit of that uh, degreaser on it. All right. Now, which way is the proper way to put a bar back on a chainsaw? This way or this way? Depends on which is worn, both. Does anyone else have another idea? Either way. Um, yeah, actually, this is a, you, you can put it back on either way. Like Mike said there, you want to put it on um, so that you can use both sides. Because you essentially on this bar, you have two sides of where that you can use. Um, when the chain's spinning on here, it's going to put pressure on certain points of the bar. And, uh, and over time, that will wear down. This is a fairly soft metal. It's going to wear down a little bit. And uh, if you flip the bar over, you've just gained all that material back on the other side. So every time I, I sharpen um, my chain or every time I go out and use it for the day, usually, I'll just flip my bar over to the other side so they get an even wear on the bar um, as I'm using it. I didn't bring my other bar. I've got a bar that's very heavily used and it's very pitted. And I don't use that bar that much anymore, but it would have been a really great example had I brought it, but I did not bring it. Um, this tool right here is uh, just a little hook. And you can use a credit card. You can use anything that's going to fit in this little space right here to very easily clean this out of all the gunk that gets in between your chain and the bar. So if you've got an old credit card that you don't like, maybe a spouse's card that was used a little bit too much, it's a perfect tool, um, a thin blade of metal like this. I don't recommend a um, screwdriver, but you can use a screwdriver if it's straight bladed and going to fit okay in there. The main thing is you don't want to put too much pressure on the uh, um, the actual rail right here and split it apart anymore. But a lot of gunk comes out when you do that. And then the other part, I didn't realize I was going to be down on the floor doing this. Um, you want to get your... The, uh, the nose of your bar has a little bearing in it, and you want to clean out those teeth. There's little teeth on the front of your bar here that helps spin. Um, with this bar, and with most bars, except for steel bars, we'll take a look at that later, there's a little hole up front, kind of like this hole back here, but it's to lubricate the bearing that sits in the nose of your bar. And this needs to spin freely. And if it doesn't, it's going to bind up. It's going to cause your saw to work harder, to heat up. So this is just a grease. This is a, a specific um, grease gun made by Oregon. It is a chainsaw grease gun. And what you do is you put the tip right there in that hole. Give it a couple pushes. And then you should see grease come out the other side. And then you know it's going all the way through. But then you want to rotate that nose piece again a couple of times. And you want to make sure that the grease that's coming out on the other side is clear or, or, or the same color. So it's going to be a blue color. If we can get it in there. Oh, there we go. You can't really see. The, the end of it's dark brown, which means it's dirty. And this part's blue. And that indicates that we've gotten the grease all the way through and hopefully cleared out any of the dirt or muck that might be in there. And this is going to rotate a little more smoothly now. There we go. Now, if you put too much on there, 
it is going to get on your chain, which is also fine, but it's a little stiffer than the chain lubricant that you would usually use. But that's all you got to do for a bar. Clean it off, clean in between the rails with something, and then make sure your nose is lubricated. The nose on your bar, not this nose. Now, for the actual chain itself, there's a lot of things you can do. This one, this one is pretty dirty. Um, I should have brought a bucket, and usually I just have like a little bucket, like a takeout bucket, that I would put it in there, spray some degreaser in there, and go ahead and let it soak for a minute. And then I would take a paper towel or shop cloth, and I want to clean it off really well. I don't want to leave that degreaser on there. Now, when you're taking a chain and you're rubbing something on it, make sure you're rubbing away from the pointy parts and not towards the pointy parts. But even that's going to help get enough kind of grime off here so we can put it back on. Now, if you're going to store this chain or you're going to put it back on your saw, you want to use chain lubricant um, to get in there and actually uh, make sure that it has lubricant back on it there. So... I've just got a little bit of chain lube in a little container like this. If I have my little bowl right there, I'd put a little bit in there. I'd work it in so that I've got a little bit on there. And then all you got to do, put your chain back on. Get it seated in that nose right there. I haven't cut myself yet. That's good. And then we will put it back on here. You want to start by getting the... Uh, chain back on the sprocket, and that's the geared section right here in the back. Um, and then lining it up on your body. So, now this one, the adjuster for the, um, for the bar is on the cover. So I need to get the cover back on here and lined up so that it will line up with my bar. I don't usually do it backwards like this, so there we go. Okay, and then what you want to do is just bring the tension back up on the chain. So right now you can see it's hanging down there pretty low. I'm going to bring the tension back up. I'll try to. There we go. Now, different people have different opinions on how loose your chain should be. On a small saw like this, I want a little bit more right there. You don't want it to be so loose that it can pop off easily. But you don't want it to be so tight that it can't rotate, which is a very exact kind of way to put it, right? Uh, but you essentially want it to, the bottom of your chain should not quite be popping out of your bar at the bottom there, but it should be. There we go. That's pretty good. It will stretch. Now, this is a pretty short chain right here, so it's not going to stretch too much, but it is going to stretch. And that's a very key thing. The other thing is you want to hold the bar up when you're tightening it down, because when you're pushing down, your bar is going to tilt up. And you want it to, it's going to tilt up like that. So you want to kind of preset that so that while you're, when you go and get that first cut going, it doesn't actually rotate on you, and then suddenly your chain is now looser or tighter. And then we want to check to make sure that our chain spins freely. Now, it does have an electric motor, so i got to pull the motor along with it. That's that sound there. That's pretty good. And, uh, and I got a little bit of looseness, looseness there. So we're good. We can tighten this guy up. Um, Besides actually sharpening the chain, which I'm going to show in a little bit, that's pretty much all I would do on this saw right here. Any questions on on this little guy? Or why you might want to use it? I'll have it. Yeah.
Good question. So if the chain is worn out, um, like like a dull chain, you mean? Sure, sure. Um, so if if a if a chain is dull, you're going to notice that your the the chips are going to change, um, that you're that are coming out of the saw, and you're going to notice it's going to be harder. You're going to have to put more force on it to cut. With a properly sharpened chain, you should literally be able just to rest the saw on the wood, and it'll start to pull itself through. Um, if you're having to really push, then you know. That, um, that you're putting more force on it, or that if you've gone from putting less force to more force, that the cutters are starting to kind of um, get worn out. Um, once the saw is warmed up, once you've used it for a couple of minutes, and then you stop the saw, you'll be able to see this will be hanging down further than it is right now. You'll be able to see, is it hanging down too far? In which case, you might want to go and tighten it up a little bit at that point. Um, and then uh, an important thing to note, too, is once you're done, you want to loosen that chain back up because if you tighten it up after it's stretched out a bit and then you leave it on your saw, it'll tighten up once it cools down around your bar and it'll start to bend your bar if it doesn't have enough slack in it. So always loosen your chain when you're done so that when it cools, you've got enough space right there. All right, for time, I'm going to get over to the big saw real quick because it's a lot more fun. <clears throat> Okay, so um, this is a steel MS460. This is probably somewhere between 10 to 15 years old. I actually don't know. There's no serial number on it. I couldn't age it. I bought it a couple of years ago, um, and uh, they've had two generations since then, so it might even be older than that. It's a really nice saw. It's a 77cc saw because it's a gas saw, and they measure everything in cc's or cubic centimeters. Most of your saws you might go and buy at Home Depot or Lowe's are generally going to be between 35 to 50 cc saws. The residential saws, um, they're meant for the weekend warrior that's going to go out there once or twice a year maybe and cut limbs or cut brush or something like that. You then have rancher saws. They tend to call them rancher saws, which are more between the 50, 55 to 60 or so cc range. And those are a little bit more heavily built Saws usually meant for your, uh, your, your farmers, your ranchers, your people who are doing a lot more work. Um, um, and they have more features than those, those kind of introductory saws. This is, a, this is in Still's professional line, which means it's got a lot of fun bells and whistles. You can tune it. It's pretty powerful for these sides. It's pretty lightweight. Um, it can also be a little more temperamental. I found that the... Uh, the smaller saw that I used to use, which was the consumer saw, was actually a lot easier as far as like tuning and everything like that. This one's a bit more temperamental, but now that I've learned how to do it, it's not that hard to do. Um, <clears throat> this has a 25 inch bar, which is probably good for just about anything you might run into. I've got a 28 for it, that, that's the well-worn bar that I've used a lot. And then I have a 36 inch that I've used to sawmill to do, to do milling with this saw. And really that's probably pushing the limits of this saw itself. It's not meant to do that but it's, it is able to do it, which is pretty nice. Um, and for most of wood turning type stuff you might be doing, this is probably um, bigger than what you would probably want anyway. Um, but I got a great deal on it, so I'm not going to complain. It's a great saw. Um, but let's get into cleaning this guy out, and then I want to show you how to sharpen chain. Um, if you have questions about saws, you know, Husqvarna, steel, um, company called Echo, um, they all sell like their consumer ones in, you know, like a Home Depot, um, Ace actually sells steel saws in the entire line, but then a lot of the um, um, uh, small engine shops that sell lawnmowers and things like that will also sell chainsaws, and they're usually a, um, a great resource for servicing a chainsaw, um, buying a chainsaw as well. They will usually have more options than that. Um, so if you're really serious about getting a nice saw, I'd go to someplace like that. Um, Mesh. Small Engine is over in Lenexa. That's where I've gone to with, with my saws in the past. They're really good. Um, surprisingly, most Ace hardware is you can get steel um, um, parts and, and chains and everything like that pretty inexpensively if, if they have that there in the shop there. Um, um, anyway, so, uh, but there's lots of places where you can, you can buy a saw or get a saw serviced if you have not had one serviced in a while. So with this saw, because it's a gas saw, we've got a few other things we've got to contend with. The first one is we need to clean the air cleaner. So you take our back cover off here, and this is our air cleaner. And it's really simple. You just take it to a crash can and bang it. And most of the big particles are going to come right out of that. 
Um, not all air cleaners on saws are this shape um, or this style. This is this is kind of like almost like a car type air cleaner. Um, some of them will be more of like a, a softer felt or foam material. Um, and most of them actually recommend to really clean them is you soak them in water to get all the particles off of the um, off of the material. They don't recommend using compressed air. Most people use compressed air. And if you're going to use compressed air, you want to go from the inside out to blow the particles out, not from the inside or the outside in. Because that you could, you could potentially force things through the material, and then it's not really going to be blocking material anymore at that point. It's going to just be letting larger particles in. Um, so again, if you're going to use compressed air, I'm not going to tell you not to, because I'm not going to service your saw. Um, but I wouldn't recommend it uh, unless it's, you know, um, uh, a kind that is not as sensitive to highly compressed air. Um, but soaking it, and then you want to make sure you let it dry completely before you put it back on the saw. You do not want to put a wet um, air cleaner back on the saw. That would be bad. Um, so make sure that it's fully dried. So you don't do that before you're going to use it. You do that after. And then you just replace that. <clears throat> just like with the electric saw, we're going to remove our bar and chain. We have a special tool for that. Now this does not have captive nuts on it, so uh, make sure you keep track of these because when they fall into a pile of shavings, they are hard to find. This guy slides off here. And then uh, take this guy. Now I did not clean either of these saws after I used them last because I knew I was gonna do this demo. So they are a little dirty right now. Those cutters are sharp too, so be careful when you take that on and off. This one has a lot more muck on the inside right here. Um, and so I'm definitely gonna come over here, clean it off. And this is where the uh, toothbrush comes in handy to really get all this stuff out of here. Because these panels are all white, if you can believe it underneath. They're not right now. This is a little cover on my saw that covers where the uh, lubricant comes out for the bar and chain. So make sure that's nice and clean. And again, if I was going to go right back out and use this in a couple of days or a week or two, I'm, I'm not going to do a deep clean on it. I'm just going to do something like that. Take my towel. And again, try to make sure that where the oil is going to come out, the lubricant for that bar and chain is all clean. And we want to make sure that our clutch right here Spins freely enough. It is pretty dirty in there. I am going to need to clean this out pretty good, but not tonight. Now, if you don't know how a chainsaw works, um, your chain spins around this gear right here, which is connected to the motor, which spins and uh, causes that chain to move. This is your brake. When the brake is engaged, that assembly doesn't turn. Now, if you're going full bore out and you push that down, it will slow down eventually. Um, but it's pretty strong. And all that is is just a, a wire or, or a bar wrapped around here that's connected up here that once you push that down, it uh, grabs onto that, that clutch drum and holds it in place as best it can. Um, so uh, so if you didn't know how that works, that how the, that's how that works. While I have this cover off, do we have any questions? Do you guys have any questions about what all is in here or what you might want to clean at all? Rick? Yeah. Toothpick. Uh, on this one, it's pretty big, actually, so I could even push this in just fine. Um, but this hole right here is mainly where it comes out. 
So a toothpick, a needle, something, something thin, probably something metal and thin, like a straight pin or something like that would be best. Um, and there isn't a whole lot of in between here and, and, and uh, in the tube. So if it is blocked, it should be pretty easy just to remove like that. Um, th as this moves, as your clutch moves, it uh, pushes a drum that or pushes a gear that pushes oil out. And so there's always going to be pressure from that gear pushing oil towards the bar. So as long as there isn't anything really obstructing that, it can even push out small stuff as well. Yeah. Does that answer your question? All right. And then clean your cover. Some of them do. Some some saws have a like an extra button where you can push additional oil out. It should have a, an oiler that's always running, but if you need additional oil, it'll give you that option. And then some saws have an adjustable oiler, which this one does, so that if you're using a smaller bar, a 20 or 25 inch bar versus a 36 inch bar, you don't need to use the oiler at full blast. Most of the consumer saws that you, that you see out there have a don't have an adjustable oiler, so what you see is what you get. Um, but this one is nice because when I have it fully open, it just sprays oil out off my bar really easily. So I kind of, I turn it down so that I'm only getting as much as I want coming out to make sure I've got good oil coming around on my bar and chain. All right. <clears throat> oh, so on this bar, and this is true of most steel bars, I think all of them, as far as I know, it has a sealed bearing right in here. So it is not, uh, you don't need to lubricate it. You don't need to grease it at all because it is all um, greased for life. The only problem with that is if for some reason that grease escapes and suddenly it doesn't start to work anymore. So this bar actually has a removable nose so that there are these little, um, three little rivets right here that you pop out. This whole nose piece comes off. You can put a new nose piece on and um, bang those rivets back in and then you're ready to go. Um, because you can get a lot of life out of a, out of a bar like this. You don't need to uh, throw a bar away just because your your nose sprocket is uh, is worn out. Um, it's a more expensive way to make a make a bar. So that's why on a lot of smaller saws or a lot of um, consumer saws, they don't come with a bar that is like that. But you can get a bar with a removable nose and pretty much any size you want to. We also have lightweight bars, which use different kinds of ceramic composites to make them a lot lighter weight. Because um, when I put my 28-inch bar on this saw, it actually tips my saw forward because the bar is fairly heavy. Um, and it's a lot heavier to lug around than the smaller 25-inch bar here. That's a great question. Um, no. For steel bars, steel makes bars for their saws. So generally, their their bars will go on some other manufacturer's saws. But most other manufacturers who make bars make bars for every kind of saw out there. The The actual way that the bar connects to the saw is the, is the factor that, uh, that differentiates one bar from the next. Um, and that's this size right here, the spacing on the oiling holes. And, and so they say the bar end, there's a number for this end right here. And any bar with this same um, setup can go on this saw right here. And this bar could go on any saw that has the same um, type of setup um, it is. So, but a lot of manufacturers like um, Husqvarna uses bars made by Oregon. Oregon makes bars for pretty much everybody because that's all they do is they make bar and chain. And so you might buy a Husqvarna saw, and it'll say Husqvarna on the bar, but it's really an Oregon bar um, because they are the supplier of the majority of bars out there. Um, again, got to clean it out inside here. But that's a great question. Um, any other questions about bars? This one, it might be. 
Um, that's a it's, it's a it's a good question. All of these still professional level saws are currently still made in Germany of the larger sizes. Most consumer level still saws are made here in the U.S. in Kentucky, I believe. Um, but all of the higher end, I think the I think it's the 462 now, the 500i, 660, the 882. Um, those are all made in Germany still. And all the bars, I'm pretty sure, are still made in Germany um, on their manufacturing plant there. I think so. I don't think they're made in the U.S. at all. But there are different styles. This is a newer style of bar. It has a smaller nose. The older bars had a wider nose on the end right here, um, which was good and bad for different reasons. And for safety reasons, they've gone to this more narrow size right here. Yeah. Um, so if you see an older steel bar, steel bar that has like a big fat, nose on it right there. You can't buy those anymore. You can buy the nose actually, because I've gotten one of those, but you can't buy that bar with that style of nose anymore. So that's kind of a weird, quirky thing. Yes, I have seen those. There are all sorts of like styles of bars out there for doing different kinds of tasks and things. They've got carving bars. If you guys are into chainsaw carving, I bet that's probably what Liam uh, O'Neill had on. Uh, well, he was working with was like a small bar that he had running. Yeah. Yeah. And, they, and they're, you know, for like, you know, making bars or making uh, bears out of logs and things like that. And there are people that carve with chainsaws, not this size, usually smaller saws. Um, but there's all sorts of bar shapes to do different kinds of things. But your standard bar that you would want to use for what we do would be just something like this, a standard bar. Yeah. Um, all right. We're going to put this back together and then we're going to sharpen it up. And that's kind of the, the main thing here is trying to get it sharp. But any other questions while I'm putting this back together here? This is not the prettiest saw today. Uh, yeah, for 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 uh, what what I've researched and what I've seen, what I've used, um, my my recommendation would be if you're looking for a a smaller kind of midsize saw. Steel and Husqvarna are, are the two names that have been around for a long time. Husqvarna is a Swedish company, and a lot of their saws are still made in Sweden. Um, and they make similar quality stuff. Um, Echo is a brand that's sold at Home Depot that is actually rebranded Shindula, which is a Japanese company. But only some of their saws are built in Japan. Some are built in China. It's hard to know which one's which. But they make some really good saws, too. Um, and then Makita... Um, is actually, most of their saws are made by a company ca called Dolmer, I believe is also a German company. So sometimes you'll see a Makita saw and a Dolmer saw right next to each other, and they look exactly the same, because they are exactly the same. They're just different colors. Um, so the the saws that are like DeWalt or Craftsman or Ryobi or Milwaukee that you might see at Home Depot or Lowe's or something like that, those are all made by somebody else. Those companies don't make those saws. Um, nowadays, Craftsmen used to um, have their saws made by somebody else like Husqvarna, would generally make saws for other companies like that. Um, but today, most of those are probably coming over from China somewhere. So I, I can't kind of judge what, what if those are good or not. But I know that if you're buying a steel saw or Husqvarna saw, those are probably the two brands I would recommend, um, gas or electric. Um, and I would recommend buying from a dealer like Mace Small Engine who knows what they can do. And they, and they, you know, you can got to tell them what you're thinking about doing with it and they will, you know, have a better recommendation than going to Home Depot and, and uh, buying one off the shelf from some guy who knows nothing about chainsaws. And they also don't service or warranty them in any way. Whereas the other shops, the small engine shops will do warranty work. Um, they will do tune-ups. They will do whatever you might need them to do. Um, and, uh, and they're generally um, pretty, pretty, they've always gotten a bad rap for being expensive. But in today's very transparent world, they can't really change price that much. You're getting additional value out of it by going to someone who has experience with something. Um, and they have, you know, and maybe their cost is like the, the MSRP versus a discounted rate. But it's usually not that much of a difference. But you get that relationship going with one of those businesses um, that you can bring your saw back to. And they'll know what to do with it when it's when they're having problems. Um, Anthony, you bought yours at Mesh, right? Like. 20 some years ago and it's still running. So you paid a decent amount of money for it at that time, but it's still running 20 some years later. So if you're, 
getting a saw like that or like this, you can look at it from that standpoint. If it's an investment, something you're going to use regularly, um, investing in a good quality saw that might cost a little more now will cost you less in the long run. I think so, yeah. Yeah. That is true, too. And that's that's something that I, I have not had problems with this saw. Well, I did have problems once, and I got it, I fixed it, and I figured out what it was. But being able to start up your saw on, you know, the first, first, second, third pull every time without having to worry about it is a big deal. Um, whereas other companies, you never know quite, um, quite if they're going to start up sometimes. It does. It's a, it's a cheater. It this thing has so much compression. Like the first time I tried to pull it, I didn't push the decompression valve, and and this is a little button on top that lets air into the cylinder. Because when you pull on this uh, cord right here, you're pulling up the piston, and that piston is going to start um, compressing air inside the the cylinder there. And it's there's a lot of pressure in there. I think on some of these saws, it's like 150 pounds per inch or something like that. So it's it's uh, it'll it'll wreck your arm if uh, if you're pulling one of these big saws without a decompression valve. So when I forget, it always hurts my arm. Do you, do you have one, Mike? What do you have? Uh, 290, 390. There you go. And I've seen like, when I was looking for this saw, I was looking for used saws and I was looking for saws that were 10, 15, 20 years old because they were a lot cheaper. And uh, like a Husqvarna Rancher, which is a 55 CT CC saw or 50 CC saw. Um, I've seen those that, you know, they were bought back in the late 80s, 90s, and they are running perfectly fine. Um, as long as you give them good fuel, you keep them lubricated, and you keep them clean, store them off the ground is a big thing. Um, you don't want to store your chainsaw on concrete because concrete wicks moisture right on through it. So if you've got a big metal casing, you put it on the ground. Six months later, you come back, you now have a rusty casing from it sitting on concrete. Put it on a shelf. Put it up on a cabinet, um, whatever works for you in your your space there, and keep it keep um, keep water away from it. Which also feed your saw good fuel. You don't need to buy this fuel. You can buy these little oil containers right here, and then mix your own fuel. Um, but if you are only going to use the saw once in a while. This is a lot more expensive, but it is um, a lot better gasoline fuel than you'll get from the, the um, service station. Huh. If you can get no ethanol, ethanol free is best. Um, as high octane as you can get, 93 would be best. 90 is okay, but Look for, and you can even search on Google, like which gas stations in the, in the area have ethanol free. And the problem is that when ethanol sits in the gas, it turns into who knows what. Yes, water is the big thing. And water is sitting in your tank right here. Because it's such a small engine, when you start it up and you suck fuel up through that carburetor, if it's water, it's not going to do anything nice to your carburetor. You don't want to do that. That too, and it'll eat through the, um, the the fuel lines and things as well. A lot of the older saws will have um, fuel lines that are all worn out and need to be replaced because they've got new fuel in it that people have not um, properly cared for, and, uh, and it eats eats away. So if you're going to mix fuel, so this is oil um, for a steel steel saw, it's a 50 to one ratio. So one of these little containers for a gallon of ethanol free fuel, and then I always put in. Um, Marine grade stabilizer is what I use because if you think about um, Stabil, um, I think is seafoam. Um, and what those do is those help prevent water buildup in your tank. And, uh, and if there is water in the gasoline solution, it will convert it so that you're not pumping water through your, uh, your, your motor. There you go. So the microorganisms in your ethanol fuel um, are what the stable or other stabilizers are 
um, destroying, I guess, right? To make them stable for a longer period of time. Um, this Moto Mix by Steel or the 50 to 1 that you might get at the uh, um, Home Depot or something like that is uh, generally stable, they say, for up to two years. Whether or not it's two years, I don't know. But it'll at least last you for a little bit longer. And if you're only doing like, you know, one one or you know two days every once in a while with the saw right there, I, I would just I wouldn't even bother with going and buying a gallon of gas. I would just buy one of these every once in a while um, because this is ethanol free, pre mixed. You don't have to worry about the measurements in any way, and uh, it already has stabilizer in it. It costs more, um, but it's also a lot faster and easier to do. Um, now, if you're going to buy a gallon, which a gallon of this costs like thirty bucks. Um, then I would go ahead and mix it, which is what I usually do at the beginning of the season that I'm going to be cutting as I'll mix, um, a gallon. And then once I get through that, I'll mix another gallon until I know that I'm not going to be cutting too much anymore. And then I'll switch over to the other fuel. The other thing you want to make sure you do is at the end of the season, if you know you're not going to be using your saw for a while is to empty the fuel out. So literally take the fuel out, dump it back out. And then you actually want to um, kind of dry run your uh, um, saw here to get all the fuel moved out of the carburetor. If there's any fuel that's sitting in the carburetor that has that oil in it will turn into sludge. That sludge will block up the carburetor and cause your engine not to start the next time you want to use it six months later. So if you've ever had a, a hard time starting your saw after it's been sitting on the shelf for a couple of months, it's probably because fuel has been sitting in there and has turned into a little bit of sludge inside your carburetor because there's not a whole lot of space inside that carburetor to, that shoots the fuel out. They're very small openings, so they need to stay clean. Um, now, I'm not a small engine mechanic, but I know enough to be dangerous. Um, so if we have more questions about that, we can do that. But I want to get to sharpening a chain um, before we're done for the night. Um, but what other questions do you guys have while I'm getting this back on here? Oh, actually, before I put this back on, if you need to know... If you need to replace a chain, and you need to know what, what chain you need, Rick, I'm going to see if I can get you right here, right by my finger. <laughs> this tells you the information you need for your chain. Rob, can we get slide number three put up? Uh, now, the numbers on here say that this is a 25-inch bar. Uh, it has 84 links has a 1.6 millimeter um, spacing or gap, and it's a 3 8 chain. Um, the uh, 1.6 millimeter, there we go. So these numbers right here um, show you the spacing of your chain. So these are the most common ones, 3 8 um, and 0.325 are the most common ones that you'll run into. Nowadays, on the electric saws, we see a 3 8 LP, which is a low-profile chain, which means the cutter is shorter. Um, but those are the, the distance between the links. Um, you take the measurement between three links and then divide by two, and you get that number there. The width between your rails on your guide bar can be one of these numbers here. Um, 0 0.5, 0 0.58, 0 0.63 um, are kind of the three common ones. And what that is is it's the spacing. Um, on your bar right here in between that your chain slides through. So it's essentially the measurement of the, whoop, there we go. So the measurement of one of these little teeth down here, that's a, it's, it's how narrow or wide that space is. So you need to get a chain that matches the spacing of your bar. If you get a chain um, that is too big, it just won't even fit in the bar groove. If you get a chain that's too small, it'll fit, but it's not going to be tight. It's going to wiggle around and it's going to shoot out, um, or just uh, or just not be a steady, steady spinning, rotating uh, chain. So, um, if you need to buy a new chain, look at your bar, and that will dictate the size requirements for your chain. Um, and it also lists how many, um, how big, how long the chain needs to be. In this case, it's eighty-four. Um, not 84 teeth, but 84 uh, links. Where am I at? The only problem with this saw uh, is that with the long bars, it's hard to line up. Yep. 
I also usually do this the other way too. You do not need big spikes like this, big bucking spikes. <clears throat> the ones that came on the saw were super tiny and I ordered these not realizing how big they were. And, uh, but they're great for getting through a uh, really big bark. Don't want to lose your nuts. And that is the one thing that I don't like about this cover is that it does not have captive nuts. Newer saws have captive nuts, and that is probably the one single greatest thing about these newer saws. So we're going to sharpen this up a little bit. So I'm going to actually tighten my chain up. And this is really tight right now, so that I can slide. Ah, that's probably too tight. I just don't want too much slop in it while I'm trying to actually uh... don't usually do it in front of an audience. There we go. Look at that. That's better. Okay, so it's going to move, but it's pretty tight, but that's just going to let me uh, sharpen up the blade a little more easily. So to do that, I'm going to put it in a vise. Rob, you want to bring up slide number four? All right, so slide number four shows the two most common side or two most common kinds of cutters. One of them has a very sharp corner and one has a very curved corner. Um, the semi chisel is this first one here. It has kind of a rounded edge right in there. The full chisel has a sharp corner. So these cut differently. They sharpen a little bit differently, essentially the same, but they, they just, uh, you want to make sure that that corner is really sharp on a full chisel. Um, and the full chisel is generally a more aggressive chain um, and will cut faster. Now, if you're trying to cut precisely, is speed always your friend? No. Sometimes it is. But in my experience, I have found that the semi chiseler that curved tooth is actually a better chain for cutting blanks out because with a full chisel I can with a or with that sharp corner there I can cut through things really quick it's great for cutting up um, firewood but it's a little more erratic and doesn't get me a nice clean cut like the semi chisel um, cutter does I've got examples of both up here that I can show you after we're done. Now, there are numerous ways to hold a saw. I happen to have a Okay, make sure we spin freely there. Um, I have a uh, um, bench vise right here, and this is really handy for sharpening my chain. Um, a lot of people will just take something like this. What is it? It's a great question. It's a teeny tiny little vise. It's called a stump vise. So if you're out, wherever you are working in the middle of the forest, if you're a forestry person, you carry something like this, so you don't have to carry around that. You bang this into a log, you tighten this down on your bar right here. And, uh, and it'll hold your bar so you can sharpen your chain. Ta-da. But this one's a little bit more substantial, so I'm going to use that one. Now, how many of you um, sharpen a chainsaw on a regular basis, have sharpened one, have never? Who's, who's never sharpened one? A few people. Who has sharpened one? Who knows how to sharpen a chainsaw? 
Okay. I tend to think I'm okay at it. I wouldn't say I'm great at it, but at least I kind of know what I'm doing. There are three steps to sharpening a chain. And I just threw that number out. I could be totally wrong because I didn't write it down. But, but we're going to sharpen the top plate, which is the cutter. We're going to sharpen or, or lower the raker. Um, and that is what actually um, is kind of the depth gauge for your tooth. So as this thing is spinning, and as these teeth come around the bottom, what's called the raker, which is this front little part right here, and Rick, I don't know if you can get in on the chain too closely or not. There we go. It's this little guy right here. There we go. So this is the tooth. This is the sharp part right here. And this is the raker. The raker hits the wood first. And then the wood goes over that and then takes off a very small amount of material um, based off this gap right here. So if your rakers are set really high, your chainsaw may not cut at all because it's actually blocking your cutter from cutting. If your rakers are set really low, you're going to take really big shavings or cuttings out of that log. It's going to bog your saw down, and it's going to be a lot more difficult to control. So first, the easiest thing or the easiest way to sharpen a chainsaw chain, um, you can buy these kits. It doesn't have to be a steel brand. It can be whatever brand, but it has the things you need. It has a round file and it has a guide on it for sharpening your top plate. It has a flat file for flattening your raker when it needs to be uh, filed down. And it has um, these cute little uh, adjustments, measuring things on this little piece right here. What I use this for is this part. This is what helps measure the depth of the raker. So let's see what that looks like. Um, if you're really cool, you don't use a guide. I'm not really cool, but I'm going to show you what that looks like. First of all, anybody have a Sharpie? Because I did not bring a Sharpie. See how everybody goes and looks for stuff? Um, if I had a Sharpie, I would mark this tooth right here because this is where I'm going to start. And since I would go all the way around, I want to know where I need to end. There we go. We got it. Behind me? There we go. <clears throat> so, oh, yeah, red, that works. So you take your marker there. You mark the top plate. So now I know, after I go all the way through, sharpen all these teeth, it only takes a couple of minutes. Once that one comes back up, I know that I've started there or I can stop right there. So let's start right there. I'm going to take my file. I'm going to put it up against my tooth. And I'm going to go ahead and just push right through. Now there's some magic numbers right here that you want to be aware of. On this chain, your angle um, is going to be 30 degrees going this way. Okay, Your angle up and down is going to be level. On some chains, it will be 10 degrees. But generally, these days, everyone's pretty gotten used to it being level. And so the main thing is just to remember that 30 degree angle. So make sure your file is going at 30 degrees and just push right through. On most chains, well, I shouldn't say most, I should say some, there's actually a little notch that is that 30-degree notch. We may not get it from over here. You can come look at it later. Um, <laughs> but that, that shows the angle actually on the tooth right there. But if you don't have that angle on the tooth, which this one does not, this is where the file with the um, um, this little guy comes in, in handy. You take this. I'm going to go to the next tooth. And it has that 30-degree mark actually on the uh, little gauge right here. And so that way I can line that up with my bar going this way. And uh, it'll tell me if I'm off. It also lets me rest this little guy on top of that tooth, tooth right there so that I know that the, uh, the height of the file is in the right spot. Someone's head is in the way. Who said my head? Oh, sorry. Okay. Is that better? I mean, if this was working up here, Rob, it'd be easier. <laughs> 
Is that better? So you generally want to file your teeth three, four, maybe five times. I just did this one like 20 times. It's fine. Um, and that should get most of that tooth all filed down at the correct angle for you. Um, let me do a few more of these. Or let me just do the raker here. I'll show you how to do that. And then I'm going to show you my other tool. So we're going back to our red tooth right here. And on our red tooth, we're going to take our tool here to adjust the raker. I place this over the tooth, take my flat file, and I rub it over. And if any material is coming off, that lets me know that my raker is being lowered down. There we go. And it's lowering it down to a set angle so that they're all consistent, um, which is a key thing to remember. If you have one tooth that has a lot more material on it than one back here, as long as the raker is set to the right depth, they will take the same amount of a cut. Um, some people say that your teeth need to be the exact same size, but as far as physics goes, that's not actually true. Setting the raker height will set the chip size to be the same size for you. Um, now, there are other fancy tools that you can use to sharpen a, a chainsaw, and this is probably the handiest one that I have. You like this one? So what this is right here is three files in one. It has your file that will file your tooth and file your raker at the same time. So this is super handy. So I'll go to a new tooth right here. And I line it up. It's got all my guides on it right here. And it sits on the teeth so that it's balanced. And I know that it's flat. And then I just got to give it a couple pushes. And so it's going to file the top plate here to get it sharp and the raker at the same time. Now, this specific one, I actually take the raker one out because it cuts a really deep raker, um, and I don't like how deep it is. It's too aggressive. So I always use my raker gauge whenever I do it. But you can get these in all different sizes. So depending on the, the, the chain that you're using, there, there, there might be a different one of these. This one is specifically for this size chain. And it works really fast. This is the fastest way you can sharpen that uh, that I've seen. There are other fit handy, fancy tools. But if you're doing it by hand, this is by far the quickest, easiest way to sharpen. There are other sharpening tools like this guy. This one's real fun. Uh, I got this when I was doing some chainsaw milling because this has, I can set this to whatever um, degree I want. And for my chainsaw milling chain, um, I have one here, but I have a different one that I have been using. Um, I do need to set that 10 degree angle, and I also need a different angle on, on the nose. So I can set that here, and then I can push that across. And this is the most accurate way to do it. Um, but it takes a little bit more to set up. And for what we're doing generally, we're just cutting, you know, this simple tool is going to go just fine, and this tool is going to work just fine for you too. Um, we're running really late on time, so I don't want to take up too much more time. But are there specific questions on sharpening that we want to talk about real quick? Anyone have specific questions, problems they've run into sharpening? You can also use an electric sharpener. They usually have something like this attached to it, and they go bzz, bzz, bzz. Yeah. It's a great question. So, um, Cross-cutting versus ripping, um, generally for everything that we would do here, we'd use the same chain, chain with the same 30-degree angle on the tooth. If you are chainsaw milling in a chainsaw milling frame, um, this, uh, this guy right here, this is a fancy, um, it's so fancy I've never even used it. Um, this is a fancy chain that is set to 10 degrees on the top plate. It also has a nicking tooth as well. So it actually has kind of a smaller, shorter tooth here. And those are both set to 10 degrees. It is a much slower cut. And the only way or the only reason you would want to use this is if it's in a uh, like an Alaskan mill frame. If you're trying to use this chain freehand, you're asking to get cut. It is too difficult to control because that angle is a much slower cut. Um, it's not as grabby and it will not pull through the wood as, as readily. So... 
the more aggressive 30 degree angle on these is going to be better for standard handheld chainsaw work. Um, the small saw right here has a low profile chain on it. Um, and all that means is that the cutter on it is a little bit shorter than what you see here. And you can, you know, you can look at these side by side and say, oh yeah, that's a much bigger cutter than it is right here. But they're the exact same sharpening technique. Um, you file down the top plate, then you file down the raker, and you're all set. This one will not last as long. It's yeah, it's a much shorter tooth. Uh, you know, technically the spacing is the same. It's a three eighths chain, um, but it's just a much smaller tooth. Um, but I, I use this one a lot less than I use this one here. Um, and I've never actually really worn down a chain enough to like toss it out. I've got a couple chains that I have used quite a bit, so I don't use those as much. But if I'm going to somebody's yard where I'm going to be cutting stuff for the day and and I don't want to bring all my stuff, I'll bring you know an extra chain or two in case I break a chain, run into um, nails or metal or something like that. So I don't have to rocks. So that I don't have to stop and sharpen in the middle of my day. I could just throw on my second chain and go to bed, go back to work. Mm -hmm. I've seen that. I have no idea what that what that is. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've never, I, I don't even think I've seen anyone sell it. Um, but I've seen things like that. I, I think Oregon, the company that makes probably the, I think they're the largest maker of bars and chains in the world. They make something like that. But I don't actually know how it works. Just because I haven't looked. Yeah. Uh, other questions on chainsaws, chains, sharpening specifically, anything like that? That, that is a great point. And actually, um, you have to be careful that with steel saws right now, because you can go online and search for a steel part number, and it will bring up a part coming from China that costs pennies, while the steel part might cost a couple dollars. Go and get the original steel part, because you don't know what that other part is. You can buy this entire saw in a box, and then you can put it together, and it costs about $300. Um, I wouldn't do that, but you could. Um, because there are clones that are being made over overseas that uh, that because um, this saw is so old, this this style design of saw is so old that it's beyond uh, copyright law anymore um, here in the U.S. and in other countries. So other countries are now able to take that design and build around. Um, cool thing about this saw and about most of the professional saws out there is that you can get parts usually for a very long time. Um, when I first bought this saw, I asked um, my my local shop. Can you get parts for this? He's like, oh yeah, we can get everything for that. Because um, I asked him for a few specific things that I needed, and he had them in stock. He had to order one part, a really weird one. Um, but he said, yeah, I can get any part I need for this saw, and it's been out of production for years. So that is a key point. If you're going to invest in the saw, invest in one that you can get parts for. All right. Um, I'll have all this stuff up here. If you guys want to take a look, take a closer look. If you want to try sharpening my chain, I'll allow it. Um, but uh, if you have any more questions, let me know. The mic. Oh, yeah, the challenge. So the challenge for next month is to make a handle. Now, this is a file handle, and I just made this one the other day. But I was going to mention this. All these little files that you might buy in this kit have these little rinky-dink handles on them. Make a handle that fits your hand. Now, if you don't have a file, you don't need to make a file handle. But whatever handle you might need around your house, pizza cutter handle, wine bottle stopper handle, something like that. It's a simple spindle project. You want to make something like this, all you got to do is take your file, figure out how uh, how big a hole you need to you need to drill out there. I'll get this off later. Um, I don't even know. I, I just pulled out my, my, my drawer and was like, oh, that looks about the right size, and it seems to work really well. Um, but this, if you look at them and compare, this one's a lot more comfortable than this one. And, and I, I've been meaning to make one for a long time. And the main thing with a, with a handle for a file is that you want somewhere that your hands can stop and pinch. And you want to be able to push from behind. You don't want to be holding it like this and slide off. And suddenly you're shaving your hand instead of the file uh, or the metal that you want to be filing off. 
So there you go. There you go.